it's tricky to talk about the poet Keats without mentioning another poet, Thomas Chatterton, who had the kind of tragic story that Keats would have identified with. The story of Chatterton, who was born in 1752, is thought of as the first of the Romantic poets and is widely regarded as someone who embodied the Romantic ideals of youth, imagination and potentiality rather than actuality. In other words, he had the potential to achieve so much more than his short life allowed him to. And Keats himself made a connection between the poem to Autumn and the poet Thomas Chatterton. In a letter he wrote after an evening walk near Winchester. He wrote, How beautiful the season is now, how fine the air. I never liked stubble fields as much as now. I better than the chilly green of the spring. Somehow a stubble plain looks warm. This struck me so much in my Sunday walk that I composed upon it. I have been at different times so happy as not to know what weather it was. I always somehow associate Chatterton with Autumn. He is the purest writer in the English language. Now, a story uh, associated with Chatterton is while walking along St Pancras Churchyard. He was absorbed in his own thoughts, so much so that he took no notice of an open grave and fell in. The person he was with at the time helped him out and joked that he was happy to assist with the resurrection of a genius. Chatterton replied, My dear friend, I have been at war with the grave for some time now. Chatterton killed himself three days later. In August 1770, he went to his attic room in Brook Street, tore into fragments any of his poetry that he could find before drinking a file of arsenic. He was 17 years old. And for Keats, Chatterton was the emblem of the outcast poet, crushed by neglect and of suffering youth generally. So when Keats associates Chatterton with autumn, he is talking about the way the season can represent both fulfilment and finality, abundance blended with the certainty of decline and loss. It's pretty much the view that this is one of the last poems that Keats ever wrote. His money was running out, and just over a year after writing this poem, he died in Rome. Season of mists and mellow fruitfulness, close bosom friend of the maturing sun, conspiring with him how to load and bless with fruit that round the thatch eaves run, to bend with apples the mossed cottage trees and fill all fruit with ripeness to the core, to swell the gourd and plump the hazel shells with a sweet kernel, to set budding more and still more later flowers for the bees until they think warm days will never cease, for summer has o'erbrimmed their clammy cells. Who hath not seen thee oft amid thy store? Sometimes whoever seeks abroad may find thee sitting careless on a granary floor, thy hair soft lifted by the winnowing wind or on a half-reaped furrow sound asleep, drowsed with the fume of poppies, while thy hook spares the next swathe and all its twinned flowers. And sometimes, like a gleaner, thou dost keep steady thy laden head across a brook, or by a cider press with patient look thou watchest the last oozings hours by hours. Where are the songs of spring? Aye, where are they? Think not of them. Thou hast thy music too. While barred clouds bloom the soft dying day and touch the stubble plains with rosy hue, then in a wailful choir the small gnats mourn among the river sallows, borne aloft or sinking as the light wind lives or dies, and full-grown lambs loud bleat from hilly born, hedge crickets sing, and now with treble soft the redbreast whistles from a garden croft.
and gathering swallows twitter in the skies. Keats is a poet of the senses, and the pastoral scene of Two Autumn is full of sensual images. The season of autumn is usually associated, in literature anyway, with life coming to an end, but in the first stanza, Keats paints a picture of nature in its prime. The time, or season, uh, and climate, the maturing sun, are working together or conspiring as close friends to bring nature to a peak of abundance, maturity and ripeness. In this stanza, Keats lists four things which this close relationship between the seasons and the sun has achieved. And I'm just going to pick them out here for you before explaining them in a bit more depth. So, thing number one, uh, to load and bless the vines with fruit. Uh, secondly, to make the trees bend with ripe apples. Uh, thirdly, to make large fruit and small nuts swell with plump goodness. And finally, uh, to make more and more buds so there are more and more flowers for the bees. So let's take these one at a time. The first is a reference to the grapevines, which are now loaded with fruit. Notice how nature is full of life and energy as it runs around the thatch eaves. Thatch, by the way, is a traditional English way of roofing houses using straw, and eaves are just the bottom of a thatched roof. Next are the apples on the fruit trees, which are so heavy with ripeness to the core that the branches are bending with their weight and ready to drop. We're then shown how both large fruit, gourds, which are like squashes, pumpkins, marrows and that sort of thing, and much smaller nuts, hazels, have been fattened with kernel, which is the edible part of both, and are now at a very peak of ripeness. And finally, we see the effect of early autumn on the flowers, whose abundance is shown in this clever structural device, where more is emphasised by repetition on the next line, and still more, which creates this sense of overflowing abundance. And we see at the end of the stanza with the clammy cells, which are the, the honeycomb made by the bees, they are over brimming with sweet, sticky honey. The previous season of summer is mentioned, which reminds us that this is very early autumn. And so altogether we have a surfeit of nature which introduces the first subtle note of caution in this poem. And this is created through the imagined overconfidence of the bees who, enjoying the oversupply of budding flowers, feel that warm days will never cease. But of course they will. And remember, in this poem, we need to connect a season over-imbued with energy, life and potential with a human life cut short. All throughout this stanza, though, we have these really long vowel sounds adding to the rich, sensual imagery. In the second stanza, Keats personifies nature, addressing it directly as thee. And the personification is, first of all, of a woman sitting sleepily in a grain store with her hair being gently lifted by the breeze. And this alliteration helping to mimic that sound and I draw your attention again to the point I made at the start which is that Keats is a poet who delights in the senses. Incidentally the word winnowing as well as being evocative of the sounds of the season is also a term used to describe part of the grain producing process. To winnow is to blow a current of air through the grain in order to remove the wheat from the chaff. And so we're left with an image of nature and reaper in harmony. But mention of storehouses and 
granaries indicates that time has moved on from the previous stanza and the harvest is well underway. Although the lazy tone and imagery of this stanza continues with the development of the previous personification, this time the female figure of autumn is found sound asleep on a half-reaped furrow. Now, a furrow looks like this. It's the channels created by a plough where the crops will be planted and eventually harvest. The fact that these are only half reaped means only half the crop in the field has been collected. And the reason for this is the drowsy personification of autumn, which should be harvesting the crops, has fallen asleep in one of the furrows. Mid-swing, in fact, if we go back and have a look at it here. While thy hook spares the next swathe, she's just about to take the next swing of her scythe or hook and instead has become too content to work further and has fallen asleep. There is, however, a sort of unnatural note added to this slumber when we learn that this is a drug-induced sleep, the fume of poppies. And when you read poppies in romantic literature, think opium. Now, although there were some scholarly claims, I think made back in 2012, that Keats himself was a, an opium addict, these claims have not been widely supported. But he certainly knew people who had experimented with the drug, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, for one, and so his intent here seems much more to warn than to indulge. The final image in this stanza gives us the clearest indication yet of the moving on of time. The personification of autumn continues, and this time we see her patiently waiting by a cider press. Now, cider is made from overripe apples, so the fruit is no longer at its best, but slightly overdone, past eating, and needed to be used as a late autumn beverage. I'm just going to draw your attention again to the relaxed, lazy, certainly carefree tone of this poem as we imagine watching the slow progress of the cider press hour after hour and this wonderful, sensual, onomatopoeic word, oozings. Stanza three begins with the poet advising autumn not to mourn the loss of spring. And he does this using a device called an ubisant, which is where the poet poses a series of questions to the strong and the beautiful. Where are the songs of spring? I, where are they? And by posing these questions to spring, he is able to dismiss them, think not of them. It's like he's challenging that season to provide evidence for its worthwhileness at the same time reassuring Autumn that it is at least as admirable. Thou hast thy music too, he says to Autumn. But this is now late Autumn. The sky is becoming cloudy and we even have a, a suggestion of death. Not only is the day ending, but so is the year. The fields are now stubble plains, which is a wonderful image of the harvested fields and reminds us of the letter which I showed you at the beginning of this video. And the rosy hue is another fantastically sensual image of the setting sun. This is furthered by the sad wailing of the gnats, an insect in the UK which, which comes out along riverbanks in the evening with this low buzzing sound. And notice how the images have evolved in this final stanza. The winnowing wind of stanza two has become inconsistent and the insects are lifted and lowered with it, lives or dies. In fact, this part of the poem is full of the sounds of late autumn. The bleating spring lambs are now full grown. The crickets, which are another familiar insect in the UK, 
We even see a, a, a robin redbreast, and there's no surer indication of the coming on of winter than that. But if we needed one, then Keats is on hand to provide. In winter, the birds, especially swallows, gather together in a great flock in preparation for the migration to warmer climates in the south. And we're left with the sound of these birds gathering in the skies as the surplus of light and warmth and food are at an end, being replaced with images of emptiness, desertion, and like the poet Chatterton, death. <laughs> 